<clears throat> All right. Well, this morning, as I mentioned, we're starting a sermon series on uh, the, the topic, pretty broad topic, but the topic of stress or anxiety or distress or worry, all of those things that, I don't know about you, but they, they plague me. Um, you know, I'm not constantly in a state of worry, but it rears its head an awful lot. And I, I, I wish it didn't as much. And certainly over the years, I've learned uh, a lot of things about how to cope with that and how to deal with that. Uh, but it is still true that that worry, yeah, wants to mess with us. That Satan and his minions, they love to cause us to worry. They love to bring these things up to us for us to worry about. And, and it's more complicated than we sometimes think. It's more complicated than we sometimes think. Now, there's a couple things we need to talk about before we read the, the scriptures to sort of lay the groundwork, as it were, for us. First of all, we're, we're, we're going to remember a very, 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 like absolutely critical portion or, or rule in interpreting the Bible, in understanding the Bible. A and that is that Scripture interprets Scripture. Okay? So this is really, really important because if you, if you just pull out a verse from some random place in the Bible and try and understand that verse all by itself, you can come to all kinds of conclusions that are wrong, 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 wrong. However, if you remember that Scripture, we believe, is God's truth, and therefore is unified and whole, then you know that no portion of Scripture is going to truly contradict any other portion of Scripture and that the whole message is unified. And so if one Scripture appears to contradict another Scripture, then you know that probably something is wrong with your interpretation. Right? It's not a problem with Scripture. Scripture is good. It's probably a problem with your interpretation of that scripture. And so when you look at a passage of scripture, you look at a passage in the context of all of the rest of scripture. And that is the only way, really, that you can properly understand any scripture. Let's see if we can give you a brief example. There is a passage in Proverbs. Proverbs is great. What kind of literature is Proverbs if you would give it a category? Pardon? Sorry, say that again. Poetic. Poetic. Yeah, kind of, but uh, it's also in a category of something else. Chris, you're a seminarian. Wisdom literature, yay! Right? Wisdom literature, yes, it's poetic, but it's also wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is something that teaches you, hopefully, wisdom. Ha, huh. good, right? So, uh, wisdom literature teaches you wisdom, and so you can't look at wisdom literature and just interpret it straight up. You have to use your brain. And so there is a passage, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact verse right now, but there is a passage in Proverbs that says, don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be thought a fool. And then in the very next verse, it says, answer a fool according to his folly, or he will not learn the error of his ways. So, which is it? Well, it's wisdom literature. 
And so you need to use your brain and your heart, and you need to interpret how to apply those verses in different circumstances. Sometimes it's good to answer a fool according to his folly. It's important. How else is he going to learn? And sometimes it's bad to do that because you are just going to mess yourself up and make yourself look like a moron. It's wisdom literature, right? The scriptures are like that on the grander scale, too. And it's true about, about worry and anxiety as well. The second thing we need to do is we need to understand the context of the passage we're going to look at this morning. We are going to look at Psalm 94. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the book of Psalms is actually properly broken down into five books. There are five major segments in the book of Psalms. And book one of the Psalms is dealing with a call to covenant faithfulness and, and David's deliverance and, 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 uh, and elevation as a king and uh, looking at the future king and so on. Book two is looking for hope for a future return to the temple of Zion. That is, it's sort of looking for the restoration of the people of Israel to Jerusalem and to Israel, right? And it's also looking forward to the rule of the Messianic king. Book three is looking at the promise of that Messianic kingdom versus the exile and downfall of David's kingdom, right? It's book of contrasts. Uh, verse, or book four is, is, uh, is where we're going to be looking, and it looks primarily at the Lord reigning as king. It's looking at both the current reality for the, the writers of these psalms of God as the king, but also looking at what that kingdom will look like when the Lord, the messianic kingdom, comes and the Messiah, Messiah reigns. And then book five <clears throat> is looking at, again, the Messiah as the king who is going to defeat evil and bring God's kingdom and, and is going to uh, celebrate the life of righteous living and, and worshiping God forever. So the Psalms are sort of a mixed bag in a lot of ways. I, in the beginning of the, the Psalms, you hear sort of a, an emphasis, uh, emphasis is wrong, there's a bigger weight of lament and then praise. Whereas as you move through the Psalms, as you get to the end of the Psalms, the emphasis is the bigger section is on praise, and there's still a little bit of lament because things aren't done. So it sort of shifts the balance or the teeter-totter a bit. So in a sense, the, the, the five books of the Psalms together put, to, put together a portrait of the kingdom of God and the transition, as it were, from humanity's fallenness and sinfulness and brokenness through to the hope and promise of eternal praise and wholeness and healing. It's like a, a, a poetic version of the big story of the scriptures all poured into these 150 poems. We're looking at book four. We're looking particularly at Psalm 94. And we are looking at um, verse, or book four is kind of making that shift towards that praise and hope, but yet uh, there is still trouble. And so we are looking at God as the sovereign king, but not all problems have been taken away quite obviously. And, and you need to be aware that this is a psalm of a people who are oppressed by their own leaders. 
This is not a psalm that is dealing with foreign oppressors. It is a psalm that is dealing with their own kings, their own priests, their own authorities who are press, oppressing them. So, Psalm 94, let's read this. The Lord is a God who avenges. O God who avenges, shine forth, rise up, judge of the earth, pay back to the proud what they deserve. How long, Lord, will the wicked, how long will the wicked be jubilant? They pour out arrogant words. All the evildoers are full of boasting. They crush your people, Lord. They oppress your inheritance. They slay the widow and the foreigner. They murder the fatherless. They say the Lord does not see. They say the God of Jacob takes no notice. Take notice, you senseless ones among the people. You fools, when will you become wise? Does he who fashioned the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Does he who disciples nations not punish? Does he who teaches mankind lack knowledge? The Lord knows all human plans. He knows that they are futile. Blessed is the one you discipline, Lord, the one you teach from your law. You grant them relief from days of trouble till a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. Judgment will again be founded on righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Can a corrupt throne be allied with you, a throne that brings on misery by its decrees? The wicked band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my fortress, and my God the rock in whom I take refuge. He will repay them for their sins and destroy them for their wickedness, the Lord our God will destroy them. The word of the Lord. Amen. Now, we need to be careful of a couple of things, a, a few different things. First of all, we need to be careful in paralleling our situation with theirs. So, we need to be careful of that on a number of levels because the reality is, is that the oppression that the people of Israel were facing under the kings of Israel and Judah um, is whole major levels worse than anything we might be experiencing now, okay? We should not take this psalm and wholeheartedly, willy-nilly apply it to ourselves as if we are oppressed to the same degree that the people of Israel and Judah were being at that time, okay? We need to be careful about that. Now, that being said, there are certainly things in here that we can empathize with. There are things that worry us about our own governments or about the governments of the world. Or, uh, heaven forbid, there are people who live under oppression from religious authorities or who have for, you know, in some time in the past, right? Here in Canada, and, you know, it's hard to bring up again, but it's it hasn't gone away, the reality of First Nations people who were as in great reality, literally oppressed by churches 
who started and participated in residential schools along with governments and who did some terrible, terrible things to our First Nations people. And so while we ourselves are not facing the kind of oppression that the people of Israel and Judah were facing, or certainly not on that scale, it is not that far removed from us in our country either. And then we need to be careful, too, that we look at ourselves with a correct perspective, both in the world context and here in the Canadian context. The reality in the world is that North Americans, Europeans, the folks who live in the developed world could easily be seen as the oppressors to the rest of the world. We have more wealth, more power, more resources, and we are continually taking, it feels like, from the rest of the world. And so in some senses, we have to examine ourselves to see whether we are the oppressors. We may not feel like it, but self-examination is good there. At the same time, you know, if we look at ourselves in the Canadian context, I'm quite certain that none of us here in this place are among the 1% of the wealthiest people in Canada. If you are, talk to me later. Um, you know, joking. I'm joking. <laughs> right? Um, we are not the most powerful of the most powerful. And there are things that are very concerning in, a, in our society right now. For example, uh, you know, I am not one to endorse a political party over another political party, but one of the things that is in the liberal platform this year is that they are saying that they may remove charitable status from crisis pregnancy centers. Now, they say it's carefully worded, so it says crisis pregnancy centers who give um, deceptive guidance or counseling for women in crisis, but it's, uh, it feels a lot like the same kind of shenanigans they were trying to pull with the Canada Summer Jobs Grant. And so that's concerning. Among many other things, the reality is, is that there's no political party that I go, hooray, right? There are things to worry about. And, and another thing that we need to remember in terms of context is we should never allow ourselves to say that God doesn't care about social justice. You hear that sometimes among Christian folk these days, that social justice is something that is separate and is liberal and is, you know, somehow not Christian. But that's baloney. That's baloney because God constantly is caring for the widow and the orphan and the foreigner and the oppressed. It's all over scriptures. All right. So that's all context and important for us, right? It's also important to remember that God is the one who ultimately is going to deal with the arrogant and the powerful and those who are prideful and evildoers. But for our purposes together, we need to concentrate a little bit on the worry, the anxiety. So let us look let us look specifically at that part of this. So, verse. <clears throat> let's start with verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, 
I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. <clears throat> this psalm, I, I, you could almost call it a worry psalm. <laughs> you could almost call it a worry psalm. Because the reality is, is that there are great stresses upon the psalmist. There are things that are weighing the psalmist down. And even though we may not know exactly what the psalmist was going through, even though we may not be pressured in the same way, you can identify. You all, oh, I have things that weigh me down. I've confessed to you before, I think, that sometimes, sometimes the things that weigh me down, if I'm not healthy, they can be very, very little. I can walk into the kitchen and see dishes on the counter and go, oh, and I'm worried and stressed and anxious. Or, or, or sometimes it is my friends and my families who worry me. Right? Because we care about people. We, we should, anyways. If, if you don't care about anybody, then maybe we should talk about that, too. Right? But, you know, I worry about my son and my two daughters. I worry about my wife. I worry about my friends. I worry about you. I worry about the state of the world, not just because I'm afraid it's all going to collapse, but because there are so many people, and I worry about the people. And, and in a sense, that's not entirely a bad thing. It shows that you and I, that we care, that we love, that we have compassion. The, the psalmist, and, and elsewhere in the scriptures too, the Bible doesn't tell us that we shouldn't care. The Bible tells us, in fact, exactly the opposite. We should love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves, which means we should care. The crux of the matter is what we do with that caring, what we do with that worry. This is the temptation. The temptation is to try to carry that burden all by ourselves, to walk with that burden, to do something about that burden apart from God. And, and that's not to say that we shouldn't do something about the burden, but that we shouldn't do something about the burden without God, right? If we try and fix all the world's ills in our own strength, that's only going to lead to a breakdown and to horror and terribleness for ourselves. <clears throat> and even if we get somehow to solve some of the world's problems in our own strength, chances are it'll be misguided and it'll be lost and it'll result in some other horror or terribleness. Instead, there is a reality that we need to prayerfully submit all of our worry and our struggle to God. We need to recognize the proper sense of, of what our piece of the responsibility pie is. You know, you remember that for ladies who went through, uh, who went to coffee break a few years ago and you did the, the responsibility pie. The, the reality is, is that for a lot of these things, our responsibility is very, very little, right? There are people starving in the world. Your responsibility for those people starving in the world is probably not nothing. 
but it's not the whole thing either. And the solution to it, too, it's not nothing. There are things you and I can do, but we can't do it all either. Right? So what do we do with our worry, with our stress, with our anxiety? We give it to God. We give it to God. Not meaning that we abdicate responsibility. Not meaning that we ignore the issue. And certainly not (laughs) often that we can give it to God and then be done with it forever and ever. Because it's going to creep back. So here's an example. How do you give your worry to God? Okay, so how do you... (laughs) Look, I'm pulling out a chair. That's weird. Okay, how do you give your worry to God? Is anybody willing to share how they do that? In prayer. prayer. Yeah. Oh, yep. Obviously. Yeah, for sure. Right? Now, here's the thing. I've talked with you about this before. We've talked about this before. Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, to pray without sin ceasing. Now, some of us, maybe most of us, don't pray without ceasing. ceasing, Sorry, not seizing, but ceasing. Instead, we do something close to worrying without ceasing. (laughs) Okay? So, I'm going to say this again, and this is I'm tempted to ask for your forgiveness for repeating something, but I'm not going to because it's worth repeating. Practice breath prayers. I'm serious. Paul's not joking when he says pray without ceasing. And he's not exaggerating either. And I'm not saying this because I'm perfect at this by any stretch of the imagination. It's a constant growth opportunity for me as well. Breath prayers are very simple. It is just the idea of praying a prayer every time you breathe, which hopefully is a lot. (laughs) Pray one part when you breathe in, and another part when you breathe out. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on Jeanette. Lord Jesus, have mercy on Athens. Lord Jesus, have mercy on Athens CRC. Lord Jesus, have mercy on the world. Lord Jesus, have mercy on my pocketbook. Lord Jesus, have mercy on my grandkids. You can pray the same phrase for days in a row, and it's fine. Do it. Practice it. So not joking. There are several things that it does for you. One is it does something called practicing the presence of God. Because remember, the reality is that we have this constant tendency to pretend like our heads and our hearts and inside our bodies are our own private spaces. But that's not true. The Bible says very clearly that our bodies are a temple to the Lord and that the Holy Spirit lives within us. There is no such thing as a private space when it comes to God. And so wandering around like the thoughts in your head are private is foolish from a Christian perspective. And fostering the reality that you really are in constant dialogue and connection with God is nothing but good. 
practicing the reality that there's no alone, there is only with God, is good. Secondly, it helps us rely on God and put our trust in Him. Because if I am constantly asking God to help me, however small my need may be, however big my need may be, I am properly remembering that everything comes from God. Right? The reality is that even if, for example, I preach a great sermon, the reality is is that my ability to preach comes from God. And my brain to think about these things from God, comes from God. And the scriptures comes from God. And my hands and my feet and this microphone and everything like that, all of it ultimately has its source in God. And if God wasn't sustaining me moment by moment, there would be nothing of me. <laughs> and so if I am constantly saying, God, help me. God, help those around me. God, help this world. Then really I am adjusting my perspective to acknowledge reality. And thirdly, when you constantly are praying those breath prayers, you have the opportunity to constantly place before God your worries, and that will help you to dispel them once and for all. Right? I am worried. Let me give it to God. Next breath. Oh, I'm still worried about that same thing. Let me give it to God again. Oh, next breath. I'm still worried about that thing. Oh, oh, hey, I stopped worrying about that thing for 10 breaths. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, now I'm worried about it again. Give it to God. Give it to God. Give it to God. It is only by disciplining yourself to constantly give your worries to God that you can ultimately get rid of. Your worries. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to worry about in this world. Some of it is rational, some of it is not. I should probably not rationally worry about a few dishes on the counter. Probably not entirely rational. <laughs> But worrying about the effect of COVID-19 on our children as they head back to school or worrying about our, our grandchildren and their salvation, those are legit worries. And so, brothers and sisters, let us remember what the psalmist says. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. As we talk with God, as we give him our worries again and again and again and again, God consoles us. And God reminds us that he is in control. And God reminds us that he is the one who looks out for the oppressed he is the one who ultimately deals with the unjust. And he is the one who will take care of us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, O oh God, for this psalm. Lord, we hear in this psalm that, that the psalmist and the people around him are struggling with major, major issues, with oppression and injustice and even murder and death. Lord, we also hear the psalmist wrestling with his worry and giving it ultimately to you. 
For you, O God, are his fortress and our fortress. You, O God, are his rock and our rock. Lord, you, O God, are the one who will see justice done, who will avenge those who are oppressed. And Lord, you, O God, are the one who promises to work all things to the good of those who love you. And so, Lord, let us together with the Apostle Paul practice praying without ceasing. Let us practice laying all our worries at your feet every moment of every day. And let us learn more and more to live in the peace that you bring. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.